All power, all praises belong to Him and to Him alone. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. We love you, Lord. And we praise you. Jesus. There's no one like you, Lord. There's no one like you. Worthy, worthy, worthy is your name. Can't wait, Lord. Can't wait to see you face to face. Can't wait to stand in your presence, Lord. To cast our crown on your feet. Worthy word is a lamb. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Praise his name. Praise his name. Praise his name. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. You may be seated. Praise God Almighty. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for coming out this morning. Praise His name. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. You know, those who are pushing the, glo the global warming agenda, let them come and spend a couple of days with us and see if they will change their mind about global warming. Praise the name of Jesus. Praise the name of Jesus. Don't forget fellowship downstairs. After the morning service, Saturday, 11 a.m. prayer meeting. And also keep in mind our Italian live stream at 2 p.m. Just keep it in prayer that God will use it for his glory and for his honor. This morning I want to speak to you a beautiful story. May the Lord bless the preaching of his word. This story about kindness is a story about grace, about mercy. I thought of my sermon, A Crippled Man at the King's Table. A Crippled Man at the king's table. Second Samuel chapter 9, verse 1. Now David said, Is there still anyone who is left of the house of Saul that I might show him kindness for Jonathan's sake? Now let me give you a little historic background. For you to understand what's happening in here, Jonathan is King Saul's son. If you remember last week, I mentioned to you during my sermon that King Saul lost his kingdom because of disobedience. He did something that he was not supposed to do. He offered sacrifice to God instead to wait for Samuel to come and to do on his behalf. And because of a disobedience, God took the kingdom away from him and he gave to King David. Now when Saul realized that David was going to be the next king, he tried everything in his power to kill him. He, want, he hated him so bad that he wanted to kill him. Now, Saul and Jonathan died. They were killed in battle. Now, David has been reigning as king of Israel for 15, 20 years. And now he remember a covenant. He remember a promise that he made to Jonathan. And we can read about this promise in 1 Samuel chapter 20, verse 14. 
David and Jonathan had a very close friendship. They loved each other as brother. Even though Jonathan was the son of the king and David was considered a rebel, they developed a very close, tight friendship and relationship. So now, David and Jonathan are in the field. They're talking to each other. And, 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 and we read this word, and you shall not only show me the kindness of the Lord while I am still alive, that I might not die. See, it was custom that when a new king would, would come to power, he will kill every male that belonged to the prior king. And the reason that everyone was killed is to prevent in the future for one of them to rise up against the new king and try to steal the kingdom from him. So it was a custom that everyone that belonged to the family of King Saul or any other king who was defeated to be completely exterminated from the face of the earth. Now Jonathan knows this. And he said to David, when you become a king, please, Jonathan knew that eventually David would be the king, that God has taken the kingdom from his father and given to David. And he said, when you become a king, don't kill me. Show to me the kindness of the Lord. Let me live. Verse 15. But you shall not cut off your kindness from my house forever. No, not when the Lord has cut off every one of the enemies of David from the face of the earth. He said, you know, when you become king, don't kill me. Let me live. But God forbid I'm going to die in battle. I want you to show the kindness of the Lord to my family, to my descendants. Spare their life. Be merciful to them. Verse 16. So Jonathan made a covenant with the house of David, saying, Let the Lord require at the hand of David enemies. Verse 17. Now Jonathan again caused David to vow because he loved him for he loved him as he loved his own soul. So they, were, they made a covenant and Jonathan made David swear that when he would become king, if Jonathan was alive, David would not kill him. Or if he was dead and then David was going to show kindness to his descendant, to whoever was not, has not been killed. Now we go back to 2 Samuel chapter 9, verse 1. So David remembered the covenant, the promise that he made to Jonathan. And he said, is there still anyone who is left of the house of Saul that I might show him kindness for Jonathan's sake. As we are going to look at the story, we are going to see in David's action, in David's words, a type of God's action and words towards each and every one of us. Or towards every human being. See, Saul was an enemy of David, who many times tried to kill him. But now, for Jonathan's sake, David wants to show kindness. David wants to show mercy to one of his 
descendants. You and I were enemies of God. We, you and I were alienated from the presence of God. You and I have no right to come and to stand before God. But Paul said this in Romans chapter 5, verse 10. Romans chapter 5. For if when we were enemies, see, Jonathan was an enemy of David. Saul was an enemy of David. And you and I were enemies of God. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more, having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. See, is there anyone of Saul family that I can show him for Jonathan's sake the kindness of the Lord? And see, when God looks down to you and I, and he see how rebellious, how stubborn we were against him. God decided for Jesus' sake to show kindness and mercy and grace to each and any and every one of us. We do not deserve. We deserve to be killed. We deserve to spend eternity into hell. Jonathan descendant deserved to be killed. But David said, for Jonathan's sake, I want to show him the kindness of the Lord. And God said, for Jesus' sake, I'm going to show anyone who wants my kindness. What is kindness? Kindness Listen to this. Kindness denotes God's persistent and unconditional tenderness. When you read in the scripture about the kindness of the Lord, it speaks about his, his persistent and unconditional tenderness. It speaks about his persistent and unconditional kindness, mercy. A relationship that God sick after men with love and mercy. God looks down and he's chasing after you. He's chasing after me. He's chasing after every human being because he will show to us the kindness. His kindness for Jesus' sake. Remember Jesus said, no man can come to me unless the Father drove him. So the Father is constantly chasing after people because he wants to show them kindness for Jesus' sake. He began all the way back in the garden. Remember when Adam and Eve disobeyed God and they were hiding from him? God came down in the garden. And God was looking for them. Adam, where are you? See, all the way back in the garden, God was chasing after a disobedient couple who had willfully rebelled against him. And the reason that he was chasing after them because he wanted to show them his kindness. He provided covering or their nakedness. That's the mercy of God. That's the kindness of God. Always chasing at the rebellious, stubborn people. We were enemies. But God is constantly reaching out in mercy and kindness. Let's go back to 2 Samuel chapter 9, verse 2. Remember the question, is that anyone of the household of death, of Saul, that I might show him the kindness of the Lord? 
for Jonathan's sake. And there was a servant of the house of Saul whose name was Ziba. So when he had called David, the king said to him, Are you Ziba? He said, Are you all service? David heard that there was a servant among a servant who used to be a servant in the house of the soul. So David decided to call this man called Ziba to find out for him if anyone of the house of Saul was still alive. Verse 3. Then the king said, Is there not still someone of the house of Saul to whom am I show the kindness of the Lord? And Ziba said to the king, That is a son of Jonathan. But it's crippled in his feet. So Diva answered the king question by telling him that Jonathan had one son that was still alive. But he had a problem. And the problem was that he was crippled to his feet. He was a lame man. He was disabled. He could not walk. Now it's interesting to know how he became cr crippled. And in Second Samuel chapter four, verse four, we find out how he became crippled. Look what happened. Jonathan saw son had a son who was lame at his feet. He was five years old, so Jonathan's son, when he was five years old, when the news about Saul and Jonathan came from Jezreel, the news came that Saul and Jonathan had been killed. So when the news came, the nurse who was taking care of this five-year-old kid took him and fled. And it happened as she made haste to flee that he fell and he became lame. His name was Mephibosheth. When he was five years old, the nurse who was taking care of him picked him up, trying to run away because the news came that Saul and Jonathan was dead, and the nurse knew the new king was going to kill the child. So he picked him up and tried to run, but as she was running, she dropped him. And when he fell to the ground, he broke his ankle. He broke the bone in his legs. And because of being the son of Saul, he could not go to the emergency room. He could not go to the doctor. So he grew up with his bone being broken and not being fixed. So he was crippled. He was a lame man. Notice, he, was, he belonged to a royal family. But he, made, he was made crippled by a foe. Does it not sound like me and you? Adam belonged to the royal line. God created Adam in his own image and likeness. But because of a fall, he became spiritual crippled. And because Adam disobeyed God and he became spiritual crippled, you and I, when we are born, we are born spiritually crippled. Because of the sin being transmitted from generation and generation. When Adam fell, we fell with him. And we were banished from the presence of God because of a fall. Mephibosheth, he was crippled to his feet because of a fall. You and I come, we, you and I were born spiritually crippled because of the fall. 
of Adam. Isaiah chapter 50, verse 1. This says the Lord, Where is the certificate of your mother's divorce, whom I have put away? Or which of my creditors is it to whom I have sold you? Not if for your iniquity you have sold yourself. God said, I did not divorce your mother. I did not give your mother a bill of divorce. I did not send your mother away. You, your iniquity, have sold you. It's your sin that have forced you to sell you away from me. And for your transgression, your mother had been put away. See, we as human beings come in this world with the stain of sin because of someone else's fault. And it's transmitted from generation to generation. Isaiah chapter 64, verse 6. But we are not, we are all like an unclean thing. And all our righteousness are like filthy rags. We all fade as leaf, and our iniquity, iniquity like the wind have taken us away from the royal line, from dwelling in the presence of God. Our iniquity, like the wind, has taken away in a desolate land, separated from God. Let's go back to 2 Samuel chapter 9, verse 4. So is there anyone? Yes, king. Jonathan has one son, but is crippled. Now, can you imagine you the king and have someone crippled, someone lame feeding at your feet? But let's look at David's reaction. So the king said to him, what is he? And Viva said to the king, indeed is in the house of Machir, the son of, Am of Amiel, in law the bar. David did not think twice. David said, what is he? What is he? I don't care if he's crippled. I don't care if he's lame. I don't care if he cannot walk. What is he? What is he? I still want to show him great. I still want to show him the kindness of the Lord for Jonathan's sake. And that's the way when God looks down to us, he doesn't care what we have done. He doesn't care how bad we have been. He doesn't care how lowly we have fallen. He wants to show us kindness for Jesus' sake. Not because you deserve, but for Jesus' sake. God does not look for things that you and I have done that deserve love. See, grace, listen to me, grace, kindness, operate apart from the response of the, of the ability of the in, in, individual. God does not look to any ability that I have to respond to him. Grace reached out to someone who does not deserve, and he said, I want you. I want to forgive you. I want to restore you. I want to bring you back in a right relationship. That's what grace is. Grace is one-sided. It's not two-sided. Grace begins with God. And for Jesus' sake, he wants to demonstrate it. And he wants to show it to us. Grace is God giving himself in full acceptance to someone who does not deserve. Let me say it again. Grace is God giving himself in full acceptance to someone who does not deserve. It's something that you cannot earn and it's something that you cannot repay in back. That's grace. That's kindness. He gives it to us 
even though he knows that we cannot repay him or deserve it. He wants to give it to us any way. See, a lot of people would have looked at this kid. I mean, he's a, it's, it's, a, it's an, an adult now. And they would have rejected him. Ooh, I don't want to be, I don't want to hang around with a crippled man. I don't want a crippled man in my house. But David said, what is it? What is it? David valued him greatly. And that's what God does. When he looks down to people, God valued them greatly. He sees the potential that is in every human being life. He sees what he can do if they only allow him to surrender life to him. Verse 5. Then King David sent and brought him out of the house of Machir, the son of Amiel, from Lobar. I want you to know that David began the action. David sent people to get him. You know, it's interesting, Mephibosheth, he wasn't looking for the king. The king wasn't looking for him. I wasn't looking for God. God was looking for me. And the reason that I am here, and you are here this morning, we were not looking for God, but God was looking for us to show us kindness. And when God came in our life and he showed us his grace and kindness, we respond to his grace and kindness. And that's why we're here this morning. Mephibosheth was not looking for the king. The king was looking for him. Paul said that there was no one to seek after God. But God seeked after him. And even today, Jesus is still looking for handicapped people, disabled people, broken people, lost people, nobody people. And Jesus is standing with his horn wide open saying, Come unto me, and I will give you rest. As he said in Matthew chapter 11, verse 28. Or, as Jesus said in, in Revelation chapter 22, verse 17. Whosoever will, whosoever will, let him come to the water and let him drink of the water freely. That's what Jesus is doing. It's looking, it's changing, crippled, lost people because he wants to show them his mercy, his kindness. Verse 6. Now when Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, the son of Thor, had come to David, can you imagine what went through this, kid's, this man's mind when somebody knocked at the door? And then they announced themselves as the servant of King David. I guarantee you the first thought that came to his mind, he wants me so that he can kill me. I guarantee you that's the thought that came to his mind. He's looking, he finds out that I am still alive, he finds out that I am a son of Jonathan, and he wants to kill me. He wants to kill me. Now, he comes to David, I want, I want you to know how he responds to him. I, I want you to know his humility. He fell on his face. He prostrated himself before King David. And then David said, Mephibosheth. Can you imagine what, must, what delight, what joy must have come into the heart of, this, of Mephibosheth? When he heard the king call him by the first name, Mephibosheth, and he answered, Here he is, your servant. Even though he was crippled, 
Even though he was lame, the king received him. Humility. And listen to me. The reason a lot of people are not saved today, the people, the reason why a lot of people miss heaven is because of pride. Because of an unwillingness to humble themselves before God. An unwillingness to admit, I am lost. I am a sinner. There's a lot of people who think they are good, who think they are not as bad as someone else, who think they have not done any bad, any so bad things. And because of their pride, they refuse to humble before Jesus. And they miss this kindness, this grace that God is offering to them. Look, look at verse 7. I, it, it bowed down before the king. It's, it, it, it's waiting a sentence. I got to kill you. And then first he had a And David said to him, Do not fear. Mephobosheth, don't be afraid. I'm, I, I, I didn't brought you here to kill you. I didn't brought you here to chop your head off. For I will surely show you kindness for Jonathan, your father's sake. Look, look at this. And I will restore to you <coughs> all the land. Of Saul, your grandfather. And look at this. And you shall eat bread on my table continually. Wow. We talk about kindness. We talk about grace. We talk about mercy. <coughs> David promised him three things. I'm going to be kind to you for your father's sake. And this is what God does. I'm going to show you kindness for my son's sake. You remember the woman caught in adultery? They brought it to Jesus, huh? And they were waiting for Jesus to condemn them to give them the right to pick up the stone and to stone her to death because she was guilty of adultery. But remember Jesus? He didn't say a word. He wrote on the sand. And they all left. And when she was left alone with Jesus, he could have condemned. But said, woman, go. And sin no more. Kindness. Grace. Mercy. Remember Zacchaeus? Huh? Short man. He heard that Jesus was in town and he wanted to see Jesus. So he ran ahead of the crowd and he, he climbed the, the sycamore tree and he waited for Jesus to come so he could get a glimpse of him. And when Jesus came and he looked up and said, Zacchaeus, come down because I'm going to come to your house today. See the kindness of God through Jesus. So David said, I'm going to show your kindness to you. You don't deserve it, but for your, for, your, for your father's sake, I'm going to be kind to you. The second thing that David promised him, I'm going to restore to you all the land that belonged to your grandfather. What did... The, what did 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17 says, If any man be in Christ is a new Christian, creation, all things are passed away. Behold, everything is made new. See, when we come to Jesus, he restored to us all that we have lost. He restored unto us all the brokenness. He's going to fix all the brokenness that we have caused and restore to us something beautiful. 
Remember what it said in Joel, I will give to, I will restore unto you whatever the conqueror has eaten, whatever lo the locust has eaten. That's God. God is in the restoration business. He restored to us whatever we forfeit because of sin and disobedience. And then he said, you know, from today on, Mephibosheth, you're going to eat on my table. You're going to eat with me. You're going to be feeding. Can you imagine Mephibosheth feeding around the table with Jonathan, sons and daughters? Can you imagine he had no claim to the kingdom, but now is a, a child. He's been adopted into the family of the king, and he has the same rights like his other sons and daughter. It's not what happened to me and you. We have no claim to God. We have no claim to the kingdom of God. We have no claim to the benefits that belong to the children. But look what it said in 1 John chapter 3, verse 1. 1 John chapter 3. Behold, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed on us, that we should be called children of God. What kind of love the Father hath pour, poured out upon us, that we should be called children of God. Therefore, the world does not know us because he did not know him. See, we are children of the king. Of the king. We are children. We belong to God. He said, Mephibosheth, from today on, you're going to be sitting at my table with my son and daughter, with my wife. You're going to eat with me. You know, Jesus made the same promise to his disciples. Look what he said in Luke chapter 22, verse 28. For, for you are those who have continued with me in my trial. Now, verse 29. And I bestow upon you a kingdom, just as my father bestowed one upon me. Look at verse 30. That you might eat and drink at my table. David said to Mephibosheth, from today on, you're going to eat on my table. Jesus promised his disciples that they will be feeding and eating at his table and sit on throne judging the 12 tribe of Israel. Jesus told the disciples, because you follow me, because you've been with me in the good and the bad time, I'm going to allow you to sit on my table, in my kingdom, and to eat with me. What about me and you? He made the same promise to us. Look what it said in Revelation chapter 19, verse 6. And I heard, as it were the voice of great multitude, as the sound of many waters, and as the sound of many thundering, saying, Alleluia, for the Lord God omnipotent reign, heaven, Seven, seven, one. Let us be glad and rejoice and give him glory for the marriage of the Lamb has come and his wife has made herself ready. There's going to be a wedding. There's going to be a party. And, and verse 8. And to her it was granted to be arrayed in fine linen, clean and bright. For the fine linen is the righteous act of the saint. And verse 9. Then, the, then he said to me, write, blessed are those who are called to the marriage supper of the long sea. God called and we respond. And because God called and we respond, one day we are going to see at the table and we are going to eat and drink with Jesus Christ and with all the saints. Mephibosheth, 
from today. You shall eat at my table. And the Lord promised to us the same blessing that one day we are going to see it around his table and eat and drink with them. Talk about kindness. Talk about grace. We talk about mercy. Let's go back. Let's finish this up. 2 Samuel chapter 9, verse 8. Then he bowed himself and said, What is your servant? That you should look upon such a dead dog as I am. See, it was an it was a Eastern custom that when someone will appear in front of the king, he will abase himself. He will self-depreciate himself. And that's what Mephibosheth is saying. He said, who am I? So you should look upon me. I'm a, he said, I am like a de- dead dog. I am, a, I am bad. I'm a crippled man. I can be no help to you. Why are you looking down to me? Why you want to be merciful to me? Why you want to be gracious to me? Huh? Humility in the presence of the king. Verse 9. The king called to Ziba. So a servant said to him, I have given to your master's son all that belong to Saul and to all his house. I want you to know that David is giving to him more that he had lost in the beginning. He's telling Ziba, I'm giving back to your master's son everything that belonged to him. Look at verse 10. You that are for and your son and your servant shall work the land for him, and you shall bring in the harvest that your master's son might have food to eat. But Mephibosheth, your master's son, shall eat bread on my table always. He said, Ziba, I'm giving back to your master's son all that belongs to him. You, your son, and your servant are going to cultivate the land for him. You're going to work for him. Make sure that he has food. But him personally is going to eat bread on my table Forever. As long as I am alive, as long as I am king, there's going to be a place at my table for your master grandson. Now Ziba had 15 sons and 15 and 20 servants. Talk about restoration. See the grace of God? We were nothing. We were walking on a way to hell with no hope, with no future. God stepped in the picture for Jesus' sake. He saved us and he restored unto us everything that we have lost. Verse 11. Then Ziba said to the king, according to all that my lord, the king, had commanded, his servant, so will your servant do it. As for Mephibosheth, said the king, he shall eat on my table like one of the king's son, crippled, but sitting at the king's table with a sons and daughter. No discrimination, same, same privilege, same rights, sitting at the king of the king you know God restored to us everything that Adam loved of disobeying him God restored it to us when you become a born again Christian God restored to you everything that he was loved by Adam verse 12 Mephibosheth had a young son whose name was Micah and all who dwell in the house of Ziba were servants of 
Mephibosheth. In verse 13. And Mephibosheth dwelt in Jerusalem, because that's where the king lived, for, for he ate continually at the king table. And he was lame in both of his feet. He was crippled. He was lame. But he ate continually at the king table. Wow. Talk about kindness. Talk about grace. Revelation chapter 21 verse 3 said this. The tabernacle, of, behold the tabernacle of God is with men. And he will dwell with them. They talk about the future. When God is going to make the new heaven and new earth, there will be no separation anymore between us and God. God will dwell with men. And they shall be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God. We will be sitting at his table for all eternity, eating and drinking with them. Let me finish with this illustration. A story is told about Fiorello La Guardia, who when he was the mayor of New York City, during the worst days of the Great Depression and, and, and during World War II. The New Yorker used to call him the little flower because he was a very short man, 5'4", and he always wore a carnation in his jacket. And because he wore this carnation, they used to call him the little flower. He was a very colorful, Character. He was a very different kind of a mayor. He used to ride the New York City fire trucks. And when the police used to go to raid the liquor store and the nightclub, used to go along with them doing the raiding. And when the New, when the New, York, New York newspaper was on strike, he, every morning, he will go on the radio and he will read the Sunday, the Sunday fun, funny story to the kids. It was one bitter, bitterly cold night on January of 1935. The mayor went to a night court. He dismissed the judge and he took over the, the duty of a judge for the night. The first case that was brought before him was a elderly woman who was been convicted for stealing a loaf of bread. The judge asked her why, and she said, you know, I have two granddaughters. The husband left my, my daughter, and she has two granddaughters. They're starving to death. And I didn't know what to do. So I stole this loaf of bread so that I can bring home, so that I can feed my two granddaughters. The judge wanted to dismiss, but the, the storekeeper the one from, from where she stole the bread, it said, Judge, the area where I have my store is a very bad area. There's a lot of crime. Now, if you are going to forgive this woman, if you're going to give just a slap and send her home without declaring guilty, and then everybody else is going to hear, and everybody else is going to try to take advantage. So please, Condemn her. So the, so 
the mayor looked at her and said, woman, it's right. You are guilty. And I have to condemn you. I have to pass judgment upon you. And the judgment is going to be $10 or jail time. She said, I don't have $10. But the judge already put his hand into his pocket. He took the $10 and he was going to pay the fine for this woman to go free. And after he pronounced the sentence, he looked at everyone in the courtroom and said, you know, you should be ashamed. You who live in New York City, you should be ashamed to let people starve to death. So I'm going to find each and every one of you 50 cents. Each and every one of you in this courtroom have to give 50 cents. And we are going to give to this lady to go by food. And it's amazing. They collect $47.50 and they give to the lady. See, she came in the courtroom Guilty, and when she left, she left to 47 50. And even the owner of the shop had to put 50 cents and be given to her. That's the kindness of God. He not only saved us, but also He gives us more. He makes us part of His family. We become sons and daughters of God. His promise that is preparing in place for us to one day is going to come back and take us home to inherit this place that we for us. And also, he promised that one day we're going to sit at this table, we're going to eat and drink with them, and we're going to spend eternity with them. Is there anyone from Jonathan family that I can show the kindness of the Lord. Yes, he has one son, but he's crippled to his feet. Beautiful story, eh? Beautiful story. That's why John Newton wrote the song, Amazing Grace. Because when you really think, it's amazing grace. Because it's a, it's a kindness, it's a grace that we don't deserve. But it's a grace that God voluntarily offer to anyone. That's why, listen to me, that's why when people reject Jesus and they're going to stand before him to be judged, you can't, you have no excuse. It doesn't matter what kind of argument they're going to present. It will not stand when you see the kindness, the grace, and the mercy of God in Jesus. Father, thank you for this beautiful story of kindness, story of mercy, story of undeserved love, of restoration. A beautiful promise. But we know it is your will. It's your desire that no one should perish. But that everyone should come to repentance. And we know that right now you chasing after them. And we all have loved ones. We all know someone who is like Mephibosheth, a spiritual cripple, a spiritual lame. And you look, you're running after him. You're chasing after him. And Father, we pray that right now, that they will truly understand and comprehend 
how much you love them. What grace is all about. In the same way, Mephibosheth, humble himself before you, before King David, they will humble themselves before you, and they will receive. Let's all stand up. Listen, you know someone that's, that's crippled, that's spiritual crippled? They have refused to come to Jesus yet? Right where you're feeling down. Not to speak loud, but bring it to the Lord. Pray for them right now. There's some are somewhere. Some are somewhere. This, all this through will break through. They will see themselves crippled. But they will understand that there is a place at the table waiting for them to see where the king shall be. But in the name of Jesus, bring them home. Bring them home, Lord. Bring them home, Jesus. We know so many, Lord. So many young people, Lord. We used to be so on fire for you. Used to be, used to love to come in your house. But they, they are nowhere to be seen. Because they've been deceived by the enemy of their soul. They've been deceived by Satan. Father, in the name of Jesus, we claim their soul right now. For Jesus' sake. For Jesus' sake. Bring them home. Bring them home. Thank you, Jesus.
pedir into your house so we can worship you and praise you and listen to your word. Lord, I just pray that you just thank you, Lord, for everything that you've done, for giving your life, life for us, Lord, for redeeming us, for giving us a second chance, Lord, and for blessing us each and every day. I pray that we would be great examples of you, Lord, to strive to be more like you, Lord, and to always be ready, Lord, because we don't know when you're coming back. Lord, I pray that you bring us back each and every time the doors are open. In Jesus' name, amen. 